still see a substantial difference in total body iron. And, and this is important for the baby's development as I'll go on to talk about. So again, we go back to Erasmus Darwin 200 years ago. He was saying you shouldn't be clamping umbilical cords. The baby will be lifeless if you do so. Now, one of the reasons that obstetricians today don't, you know, kind of poo-poo this or think that it doesn't really matter is I think because we have a pretty well-fed population. They're not predominantly iron deficient. I think we have good nutrition. It wouldn't surprise me if 200 years ago, Erasmus Darwin was taking care of a population that was substantially poorly, had much poorer nutrition, perhaps substantial iron deficiency. And he really did see a big difference when you chose to clamp cords or not. And we don't see that difference anymore as much, but it still may have a substantial effect. Now, this is the paper that really kind of blew things up and got it, got this, got a lot of interest because this was very important. This is in preterm neonates. These are all infants that we did immediate versus delayed clamping in every neonate's less than 32 weeks. And some people are really afraid to do this because we're not going to intubate this baby and bring it over to the warmer right away because we're going to leave it on the umbilical cord. And I've done this a few times in our uh, cesarean sections and it makes the nurses nervous, I think. But, uh, Judith Mercer did a study where they looked at 72 mother-infant pairs born at less than 32 weeks. They randomized them to just 30 to 45 seconds of delayed cord clamping, not very long. Uh, and I think that probably was a, you know, a discussion with neonatologists that were involved that they didn't want to delay too long because they got to get the baby and intubate it. Because some of these babies are 25 weekers, 26 weekers. And they looked at bronchopulmonary dysplasia, they looked at necrotizing enterocolitis, they looked at interventricular hemorrhage and sepsis. What they really wanted to find was neck. They believed that by giving the baby better blood, more blood, better ability to oxygenate, they're going to decrease the rate of necrotizing enterocolitis. They didn't find any difference. 69% versus 75%. Doesn't seem to matter. But this is not statistically significant. They didn't have any death. In the ones that were delayed, no deaths. 8% of the babies in the immediately cord clamp group died. Not statistically significant, but interesting. But here's the big thing. In the delayed group, only 14% of these infants had interventricular hemorrhages versus 36% of the infants in the immediately cord clamped group. And if you look below, you see that the majority of the IVHs that happened in the delayed group were grade one IVHs, which often don't have great, as great clinical infact, impact as higher grades, versus grade two infarcts were the more, most common hemorrhages in the immediately cord clamp group. So not only did you have fewer interventricular hemorrhages, but you had less severe interventricular hemorrhages. And really with these great, extremely premature infants, if we can avoid necrotizing enterocolitis and we can avoid interventricular hemorrhages, a lot of them are gonna do well. If we have these events, we're gonna have a higher percentage of babies that do poorly. So this could be a very, very important thing for these infants if we can really decrease interventricular hemorrhage. Sepsis was also greatly affected. Only one infant out of 36 developed sepsis in the delayed cord clamp group versus 22% of the infants in the immediate cord clamp group. And again, that seems pretty significant when we're really fighting to keep 26 weekers, 28 weekers alive, and just this minor intervention seems to have a substantial impact on this outcome. So let's talk a little bit about the theoretical benefits of placental transfusion. Um, one of the medical students, what, what kind of cell is that? Anyone know? It's an oligodendrocyte. So what's a, what's an oligodendrocyte? Do you remember? Okay, oligodendrocyte. <laughs> oh, no. One of the PD, one of the PD, <laughs> you know, Vic, Vic knows what an oligodendrocyte is, I think. Anybody else? <laughs> exactly. So it wraps, it wraps neurons. It's, a, it's, the, it's the myelin, right? Oligodendrocytes are part of our um, ependymial system in the, Neural, in our neural development, and it's what allows our nerves to work well. Without oligodendrocytes, our wires are not insulated. We do not fire our neurons very well. And there are many neurologic diseases that are involved in loss of oligodendrocytes, such as multiple, multiple sclerosis, which is local loss of myelination. Well, guess what this is stained for? See how you get this really dark staining in the oligodendrocyte? It's stained for iron. Iron's actually very important in neurologic development. And, you know, I've always said that the reason why a baby can't walk is not because it doesn't, hasn't learned to walk, it's because it's, its brain organ is not yet developed enough to support what is required to walk. 
that the neurologic system is an organ just like the kidneys and the lungs and all these other things develop enough in utero to support life outside the uterus. But the central nervous system just is an organ that's really not that developed when the baby's born. And one of the things it can't do is it can't walk, it can't talk, it can't develop language. And these things are not so much what it learns, it's the brain developing, allowing it to support these activities. Well, it turns out that you really need iron in order to build oligodendrocytes. And so if you have an infant that is profoundly iron deficient, you, you have a very reasonable reason to believe that the CNS development of this infant is going to be retarded. And I mean retarded by slowed down. So this is a little chart of how this works. Microglial cells, which are part of the, the, the system of cells, are actually the iron sinks. And as the baby's brain is forming, microglial, microglial cells become very packed with iron. And then as immature cells start to become mature oligodendrocytes, the microglial cells actually release iron in the form of ferritin. And then this is incorporated into the oligodendrocytes. And this is a fairly well worked out system. There's been some papers on it, in fact, quite a few, but here's just one, oligodendrocytes and myelination, the role of iron. There's compelling evidence that iron is essential for normal myelin production and maintenance and, and iron accumulation by oligodendrocytes is an early event in their development. So there's really a possibility that giving infants the iron that I would say they were supposed to have is important in their CNS development. And again, we are now into a theoretical benefit of delayed cord clamping. But I would argue that we're not just preventing babies from getting their complement of blood cells and blood volume, but we're also preventing these babies from getting their complement of iron that is very important in the development of their CNS system. There's one other potential benefit that I'd like to talk about, and that is that we have a lot of talk about uh, pluripotent stem cells that occur within cord blood and occur within the baby. And there's really only a fixed number of these cells. If we rob the baby of 40% of, of its blood volume, we're also robbing the baby of a substantial portion of its pluripotent stem cells. Some people would say you should harvest this and save it. But just to flip it around, why take it from the baby in the first place? Um, could that, prevent a, could that be beneficial to the infant to have a full complement of cells that, be, that can become any kind of cell in the body? If the baby suffers some sort of ischemic injury to its brain or suffers some kind of injury, is it possible that these cells are partially there to try to deal with these early traumas of life? Someone wrote a paper on this called Mankind's First Natural cell, Stem Cell Transplant. And, um, some people that are on the internet hold up this paper as, as meaning more than it does. I, I've argued that this paper is a, is a theory, theoretical opinion piece um, because I don't think it has a lot of data. But it is interesting ideas, and that's why I put it in the theoretical part of this talk, that autologous transplantation of stem cells naturally occurs at nature, at birth, in mammals, via the umbilical cord. A delay in cord clamping may increase the stem cell population in the baby and promote an innate stem cell therapy that could promote acute benefits in the case of neonatal disease as well as benefits in age-related diseases. And this is something that clearly, I, I don't think that we could prove at this point. Um, we just don't know enough about stem cells. We don't know enough about a lot of things. But um, there have been, there was one study as well that looked at behavior of infants at one year after delayed versus immediate cord clamping. And they were able to see some differences in certain behavioral tests. Uh, not knowing enough about child psychology, I can't really comment on the validity of, of such things. But, um, it's interesting. So, in conclusion to all this, I, placental transfusion occurs naturally in all mammals, um, except when another human clamps the cord early. Um, this is not natural. Um, I think that the burden of evidence is not on anybody to show that it's dangerous. The burden of evidence is to show that clamping it immediately is safe. Um, you know, delayed cord clamping clearly increases fetal hemoglobin blood volume and iron stores. The evidence supports a clinical benefit of delayed clamping. There's really no strong evidence against delaying the cord clamping. When we talk about interventions in medicine, really the burden of evidence is on the, the intervention. And I think people say delayed cord clamping, you can't prove that that's an intervention that helps. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Delayed cord clamping is what we evolved to do. We evolved to get the blood that's in the placenta. I don't have to prove that that's right. You need to prove to me that phlebotomizing the baby of 40% of its blood volume is right. And people will argue that the baby's going to become plethoric, the baby's going to become jaundice. And I'm not a pediatrician, I can't really make a 
my argument is theoretical, and my argument is, is sort of on a rational basis. But I'm going to say if that's why you're going to clamp the umbilical cord, then you are basically phlebotomizing the baby in order to prevent those outcomes. Because the baby naturally was going to get this blood that was in the placenta, so you're going to remove some portion of that blood in order to prevent this outcome. And to me, that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I really think that we have started clamping umbilical cords out of convenience. Um, we even invented a little device, I saw in that video, that you can do it in one hand. Um, and it's just been out of just habit that we do it. But I think that there's substantial evidence to suggest that we should not do this and that it benefits the infant to stay on that umbilical cord for at least a minute, maybe two minutes. Just put the baby on mom's belly, let her breastfeed, for God's sake. Do we, do we need to immediately pull the baby away? A blanket over the baby while she breastfeeds is wonderful. And we don't need to clamp the umbilical cord. Do it a few minutes later, and I think that we're going to be benefiting our infants. And I, and I really hope that we continue to see data in ne preterm neonates as well, because clearly, if a baby is struggling, we want to get the baby intubated, and we can't leave it there not, not breathing. But we need to know more, and we may even be able to develop a system where you could resuscitate an infant and intubate the infant while it's on the umbilical cord. That would seem to be optimal. And of course, remembering that at least for the first 45 seconds, the baby continues to pump blood to the umbilical cord, and it basically is on placental ECMO. So even though the baby is not breathing, it's still oxygenating through the cord. And it seems to me that we have evolved as mammals to transition to pulmonary circulation slowly, and that as we're born, we continue to oxygenate through our umbilical cord, we slowly start breathing, and slowly transition to oxygenating through our lungs. And yet, because of this habit that we've developed, we're basically taking the chick and throwing it out of the nest and say, fly, baby, because, <laughs> because we have completely removed any ability for the baby to oxygenate. And it would just seem to make more sense, as we see in all these other animals, that the baby will oxygenate through the cord for several minutes until it can start breathing. And so if the baby's sort of slow to breathe, well, it's okay. It's still getting oxygen through the cord. And um, there's theoretical benefits as well. And we may find that, that, it, that this is very important. Um, and so that's what I have to say. I hope that uh, you all got something out of it. I hope that maybe even one person changes a little bit of practice. And I, I'd love to hear what anyone else has to say as well.